Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for coming tonight. My name is Dr. Chris Coulter. I'm the Executive Director for Secondary Education here in Glendale Unified School District. Um, I want to welcome you to our CollegeWise um, seminar tonight. And before we get started, I would like to invite our translators to come up and uh, offer their services. So I'll give them a minute to head on up to the stage. Use the stairs here. Barriere Cos, Nakasum, Borasura, Serra, get a caricum, a car and half my time, Kasman Kalvak, Motan, or Achkomum, yes, when I'm sad, Kabul, Medakanja, Kamera, we have Kalvak, Amos, the Hatin, had a very higher enough. Shmakaritsu. Muy buenas tardes, bienvenidos a este webinario. Si alguien necesita interpretación en español, vamos a estar de mi lado. Muchas gracias. All right, thank you so much. Um, so we are excited tonight to launch our partnership with CollegeWise um, to support our students in planning for their futures. Our vision for this partnership is to provide our families support in their um, complex process that we go through in planning for higher education. As a district, we know that post-secondary education is critical for opening up opportunities for students' futures. Uh, we want to instill the values of lifelong learning and send students on to the path of success for their futures. For many of our students, that path includes admission to a four-year college or university. And so our district counselor, Ms. Ashley Park, who's sitting in the front over here, um, has worked really hard to form this partnership with CollegeWise um, to help prepare these presentations um, to support students and parents in navigating that college application process. So I want to thank Ms. Park for all her work on this. Thank you. And so tonight's presentation is part one of a seven part series. Um, so we hope you can see on the, the um, screen here, we have um, six more of these um, seminars scheduled for the future. Um, so we're rolling those out for this year and into next year. So um, keep an eye out for these as they come up in on social media and through your, your principal sending information out to you and from the district. We try to get out as many ways as we possibly can. And so you'll see that flyer come up again and again, and we'll keep adding QR codes as we get closer to um, the different events that are coming. Um, so, where did I read that part? Um, <clears throat> so we encourage you to attend each of the seminars in person and take advantage of the opportunity. We're also recording them so that we can um, post them on the, the website um, for future viewing. So tonight, we are super excited um, to have our guest speaker tonight is Christopher Logan. He's an expert counselor with the CollegeWise um, program and uh, to share their wealth of knowledge on the topic of college admissions for great kids without great GPAs. Um, so that's our presentation tonight. And you'll notice there's a QR code here on the right-hand side. So if I could have all of you break out your phones, we would like both students and parents to participate in this is a pre-survey. So just to kind of get a sense of where you are, and then there'll be another one at the end of the session. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Christopher. Thank you. Uh, you can go ahead and work on that survey while I'm doing the next slide or two, because the next slide or two is more of an introduction. Um, just a little bit of information about CollegeWise, uh, just to help you understand why I'm the one standing up here. Um, we are the largest educational consulting firm in the country, and we prioritize taking care of students more than anything else in the process. So we, our ethos is that we aren't just trying to drag students to some predetermined goal in any way. Our goal is always to work with the students, to work with their families, to put together a plan that makes sense for that student and for that family and for that set of finances and for that comfort level with leaving home and for whatever that student and that family most need. 
we are actually the official partner for Michelle Obama's Reach Higher Initiative. And so we do a lot of work to help first generation students and low income students and students with immigrant parents, so third, um, third culture students. We do a lot of work to help students understand the process, students and families, understand the process of getting through high school, getting to college, making sure that they land at a college where they will get through college, because the goal is not just to get them there, but to make sure that they are somewhere where they will persist through the entire process. Um, a little bit of information about me. Um, you, you may have noticed me responding to the Korean and Spanish translators. I actually speak fluent Korean and Spanish and French. Um, but I did my undergrad in math at Yale University, and I also went to Seoul de Hakyo, Seoul National University. Um, I was a two-time Light Fellow at Yale. Um, I, I actually do a significant amount of the institutional research that we do at CollegeWise. So I publish what are known as white papers. They're those very, 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 very long academic research papers about admissions, admissions trends and the higher education market. Um, I've recently written two. I wrote one in response to the Supreme Court decision last year, um, the students, students for Fair Admissions versus UNC and Harvard. Um, that is on the Supreme Court decision there about the consideration of race in college admissions. Um, that paper is actually part of the UCLA counselor certification curriculum now. Um, I also recently published one about application deadline trends. So there are a couple of different deadlines that students can apply for early action, early decision, a couple of different subcategories there in regular decision. And so I have a paper about understanding what those are, understanding what they mean, understanding how to approach them and how those can actually affect admissions. Um, those are all free and available. There'll be a QR code at the end where you can get to our resource page and figure out how to get that information. Um, one of the things that you'll see up there is that I, uh, it was on the, that first slide, but I'm our co-chair of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And a part of my work is putting out lots of free resources to everyone because the ethos at CollegeWise is, yes, we have students who do pay individually to work with us, and we do some partnerships with school districts, but we also want to make sure that education is accessible to as many people as possible. Um, this actually comes from, ooh, I, I told you I was gonna bump into that mic. Um, this actually comes from some of my own personal experience. I went to Yale, but I am from South Central, and so I did not have great access to a lot of great education the way that students in Glendale University, I'm sorry, Glendale University, Glendale Unified School District. Um, students here have access to great educational opportunities. You have great counselors. I came from, years ago, an environment where that wasn't necessarily the case, and so I know exactly what it's like not to have access to educational resources and the information, so I do everything I can to make sure that students do have that information. Um, and I do actually work as a counselor at CollegeWise as well. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in to start talking a little bit about the topic of today's conversation. I do actually wanna put out, just at the beginning, my approach to presentations is that I don't think that you should hold your questions until the end. I'd prefer that you didn't shout them at me. But if you have a question that is directly relevant to what I'm talking about in the moment, please raise your hand to ask because it will be easier for me to build it into the flow as I'm going. I, I say, know that I do love the sound of my own voice. And so it, you, your hand may be up for 30 seconds before I call on you. But if you have a question that's immediately relevant, let me know because it'll be easier if I can work it in. So the topic is admissions for great kids without great GPAs. And I want to, I actually want to reframe that a little bit that, because I think that there is a negative connotation to saying that these kids don't have great GPAs. I, these, it, this is admissions for kids without perfect GPAs. It's admissions for kids whose GPAs maybe aren't a reflection of how committed they are to their education. It's admissions for great kids who maybe didn't do the best one or two years, but who have decided that college is something that they want to focus on. Because I do think that there are some GPAs that may not be considered great that are still GPAs that these kids should be proud of, especially because GPAs are an average. They aren't a reflection of the way a student might turn it around in the last one or two years of high school. So I don't think that it's the, most, that it's the best thing for us to do to say it's great kids without great GPAs. It's, Great kids whose averages aren't a reflection of what they want and of what they are capable of. But the reason this is up there is that normally when we think about college admissions and when you look at the news about college admissions or when you look at social media about college admissions for the kids, when you scroll through TikTok and you see the kids opening their acceptance letters, 
so much of it is bad news. It's that kid who was perfect on paper, who got rejected from 37,000 schools, that kid who did everything right, who didn't get into to Stanvard or whatever school they applied to. There's so much bad news. There's so much news about how, also there's so much news that doesn't know how to use the word unprecedented. Um, but there, there's, it, there's so much news about how these selective schools have gotten more selective. Last year, Duke accepted 5%. This year, in an unprecedented turn of events, they only accepted 4.9%. Yes, we know, that's how it works. But the one thing is, if you look at all of this, all you see is, it's so difficult. No one gets in. They're, they're accepting so few students. But what you don't see is that this is only true for a very, very small number of schools. Because the reality is that in the US, I, in the, sorry, I don't actually like this picture. Um, but in the United States, higher education is actually more accessible than it has ever been before. There is a ton of information available online about it. Of course, media literacy is a thing, so be careful about what you're looking at. But there are hundreds and hundreds, there are actually thousands of schools. Technically speaking, there are 4,761 4, accredited universities in the United States. Not all of those are four-year institutions. It used to be two, but one of them lost their accreditation a few years ago. But there are literally thousands of universities for students. If you look at four-year universities, that number drops to about 1,300 because there are tons of two-year schools, but there are still literally thousands of universities, and so many of those universities are checking for students who aren't necessarily a 4.0, aren't necessarily a 3.0, aren't necessarily a 2.75. There are so many universities, there really is a landing spot for pretty much any student who wants to have that landing spot. And so just at the beginning, I really do want to emphasize when I say that there's a spot for everyone, I don't just mean, you know, that kid who got one B also has a shot. No, I mean if your kid wants to have a shot, if you, to the students who are here, want to have a shot, you or your kid, that shot exists. And that shot can still be an amazing school. I work with kids on every, se every step of the spectrum of GPAs, and I have worked with kids to find places that they will love, that they will be happy, that they will be successful, that they can study something that they're interested in, or find something that they would be interested in sticking to, because not every kid knows when they get there. And I've had students who, students who either they and or their parents at the beginning didn't think that the kid had a shot of getting in or having a great college future that would lead to a good career, get into a great school. Some of them get scholarships, even with GPAs below three. Just know that that's, there's, there's a little bit of a balance to do that. But I've had kids get into schools that they love, go to those schools, graduate. And you actually hear a story about one who, like she's thriving after not getting into one of the schools that she and her parents thought was what really, really needed to happen. A couple notes I will make though, is that there are three things we're not gonna talk about today. Um, there's a link there, and I realize that putting a link on a screen is maybe not the greatest thing to do, but <laughs> if you take a picture of it, you can go to that link later. If you have an iPhone, you can actually scan the text in the link. If you have an Android, I'm so sorry. You might be able to do it too, I just don't know. Um, that was more of a general statement about you having an Android. <laughs> um, but three things we won't be talking about today. I will not be addressing whether or not your student is ready for college. I know that I'm saying that there's a spot for every kid, but I will also admit that not every kid wants or is ready immediately for that spot. That is figuring out whether or not your student is ready for college, figuring out whether or not your student is comfortable enough to leave home. That is not what I'm gonna be talking about today. It is definitely something I think is important and there are resources that that link to help you have that conversation. That's just not today's conversation. If not, what should you do to help them figure out how to get ready for college when they might be ready for college? That's at that link. And is college right for every student? Again, that's at that link. I have opinions on this, but I won't share them at the moment. Um, I will say that I think college can be right for everyone, but I don't necessarily think that the default timeline of college has to be right for everyone. I'll share a story here that is not actually my story because I am too young for this, but um, a story from our founder is that he worked with a student years ago um, before I was actually applying to college. 
Uh, I'm a baby. But um, he worked with a student who was applying as a transfer student. So he had done a few years of community college and he was applying as a transfer to the UC system. And he had done, he, he'd gotten his associate's degree or he was about to get it because you apply before you get it. But it was actually a few years before he even went to community college because after he graduated, he wasn't ready. He didn't think he could get into a school that he would want to go to. He didn't have a counselor to tell him that that was going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so he had been working as a mechanic and he did not enjoy it. He worked at a Jiffy Lube um, and he, like, he was like, I was the guy who when you come in, just like stick my hands in your car and I don't know what happens when, after they stick your hands in a car, I drive an electric car. But he did that um, and he decided, you know what, this really burns, I don't love this, I, I wanna go back to school. And so he did and he got really interested in neuroscience um, and the, the chain of events was that he wanted to understand how pain receptors worked and so that's how he got into neuroscience. And so then he came to college-wise, he worked with our founder, Kevin, and he ended up transferring to UC San Diego. And he graduated from UC San Diego, and he's now a very successful therapist in LA. Um, he works at a private practice, and he's doing very well. And that kid, when he was 21 years old, working at that Jiffy Lube, he and his parents probably didn't think that this was a path that was gonna lead him to somewhere great, somewhere successful, but it was the path that led him there. Because for him, going to Jiffy Lube is how he experienced the pain that made him decide he wanted to understand pain receptors, that got him to neuroscience, that got him to UCSD, that got him to therapy. Being a therapist, not just going to therapy. Hopefully he was already doing that. But that was his path. So whether or not college is right for everyone, I do think it is worth acknowledging that the default college timeline may not be the timeline for every student. But getting back to how to find the great schools for every kid, the most important thing, the first step for parents and for students is search. Search properly. Search beyond just the 10 schools that you hear all the time. Search beyond the schools that make those terrifying headlines every day. The most important thing to do when you're trying to make sure that you can find a spot for your kid to land. Kids, when you're looking for a spot for you to land, if you don't have a perfect GPA, and even if you do have a perfect GPA, is to search. Because it's true, there are about 40 schools in the country where those, like, those headlines, that scary news, is true. It, there are a, there's a small number of schools who are reducing the number of students whom they admit because more kids are coming when they get admitted. There are a small set of schools where it's rough, where it's really competitive. But there are also hundreds of schools, thousands of schools that accept two thirds or more of their students. There are hundreds of schools who will give extra leniency to a student from California because they're looking for geographic diversity in their, in their admit pool. There are schools who want the reputation here, who want their name to be spread around here. Engage in the search. And when it comes to engaging in the search, I think one of the most important things to do is Focus on finding things that you don't already know because the names that you know, the biggest names, one, those are probably going to be some of the more competitive schools because there's often a reason that the name is spoken more often, and two, because you want to make sure that you're not just defaulting to something, but that you're finding something that the student will actually love. Because I think one of the most important things when talking about students who don't necessarily have those stellar GPAs is making sure they understand it's not just about settling for something because we gotta get you somewhere. There is a place that those kids can love. There are enough options that even those kids can still be picky. I worked with a student two years ago who had a 2.3 GPA, and one of the biggest things I did with him was say, you still need to be picky. You still need to tell me what you do and don't want. You still need to tell me if you want a school that's gonna be really big frat culture or really big arts culture. And he, he really wanted a school that had a lot of arts culture, and so that's what we did. My youngest sibling did not have a great GPA, <laughs> and I worked with my youngest sibling to find a school that he would love, and he currently has a full-ride scholarship at University of Puget Sound. He had a 2.5 GPA. <laughs> There's a great school for every kid. There's a school that that kid can love. There's a school where that kid will be, that, like, there are schools that are leaping over each other to get to those students because every kid is different, every kid is unique. 
And they're not just looking for numbers to walk around campus, so search. Do the search, go to the college fairs, come to events like these where you get to hear more information. Talk to Ashley, I'm so sorry, but talk to Ashley about, about that information. Talk to Ashley's team. Your school counselors know what they're talking about. And I will actually take an aside here to say, one of the things that happens a lot, because I am a privately contracted college consultant, is that I hear from families, well, my counselor doesn't know what they're talking about. Yes, they do. I have known Ashley for years. Yes, she does. I have known, Ashley, I have known people that Ashley has worked with for years. Yes, they do. They know what they're talking about. They are here to give you really good advice. I say the same thing about myself. You do not need to blindly accept all advice, but trust Ashley, trust the Glendale Unified Counselors. They know what they're talking about and they are great sources of information. Parents, students, go to your counselors and tell them what you're looking for. Tell them that you, like, you're focused on finding a great school for yourself. Ask them if they know of college fairs that are happening because the college fairs don't just happen on campus. They happen at the LA Convention Center. They happen at, like, they happen all over. They happen at like your YMCA, Swarthmore and Amherst and Puget Sound and Willamette and University of Oregon will come and they will all get together and set up their little stalls like it's a flea market. And they are there to talk to students. They are there to tell you about the school that you haven't heard of. They are there to get you excited, to get you to understand that if you want to study sports management, this is the place for you. That's the other thing to talk about is when I say search, also, like, don't just search for schools, also search for fits. Because every kid is a little different and sometimes students aren't, they don't think that there's a place for them to go do what they want to do for college. I had a student who, like, essentially, to him, he was like, I, so, twins. His sister, rock star GPA, she had almost a 4.0, and she always knew that she was gonna be going to college. And her brother did not. Her brother had, again, he had like a 2.3, and he didn't think that it was gonna be something that he could do because he was so used to hearing his sister talk about it, hearing everyone talk about what his sister was gonna be able to do. And he was just terrified. And so one day talking to him, I, like, I, when I first met them, I was working with them together just like, for that introduction. Um, I never worked with students simultaneously, but I was meeting them together. And she was so responsive. She was talking about all of her dreams, all of her goals, and he was just dead silent. And like halfway through, I just asked him, I was like, hey, you, you know you can go to college too, right? And he just like lost it because he didn't think that that was a thing for him. And then we started talking and like, all he could say was like, I love trains. I love, like, I love taking trains to go up and down. He had taken the surf liner, I think it's called, or the, the one where you go up the coast and it's nighttime and you see stars. Um, I clearly remember that very well. But um, like, and so I started talking to him and it, it turned out that he actually loved the idea of studying transportation management and or transportation engineering. When I say to do the search, I also mean look for places where there's the thing for your student to study. There are majors in hospitality. There are majors in transportation management. There's, there are majors in naval engineering. There are aerospace majors. They're, they're, the majors are so, so, so plentiful, and finding places for that are, is also a great way to find a good landing spot for your student, especially because if your student really does have one of those super niche interests, that might also be a super niche school where your student has an even better shot of getting in. Go to your counselors, get that information, talk to them about what you're looking for. They are your teammate in this. I also say, again, go to those fairs. Those fairs happen all the time. You can sign up for them. You can get the information from your counselor. You can look online to find when a, when a college fair is happening. And those admissions officers at those fairs are also great resources for you. Because you can go, you can talk to them, you can actually get their information in some cases because if they're there, they're recruiting. Many, I, I mentioned earlier that some schools will give extra consideration to a kid from California because they don't have enough Californians. They don't have enough Southern Californians on campus. You can talk to the admissions officers at these events. You can get their information. They'll talk to you about why they want, like why they want your student, why your student might be a good fit for the school. They'll be honest for the most part about all of this information. My for the most part is just they, they can't, without having the time to sit down and exchange all of the information, there will be answers that they don't know. So they will, like, sometimes they will tell you, uh, like, we can follow up on this, but they will tell you the information. 
And I know a few admissions, I keep touching this. I know a few admissions officers who I talk to all the time about how they actually connect with students and help those students build their applications for the schools so that they have a better shot of getting in. I work with former admissions officers who used to do that. Go to these college fairs because not only are they a great way for you to learn about schools, for you to get your student excited about schools, but they're also a great way for you to connect with the people who will help you get that student to land at one of those schools. College fairs are a great resource. And then, generally speaking, college websites. Um, college websites are obviously a great way to find out about the schools. You can look at their majors. You can look at what they offer. You can see what the eligibility requirements are. They're a great place for you to get a lot of that surface level information. And I say, always go to the college website. You can go straight to the admissions, the admissions page on the website too, because that's actually a great way for you to see if there is anything that you need to know to see if that's a school that's an option for your student. If you go to Every, every university has an admissions page. And you can see on that page, what are the application requirements? So you'll know, like there's an essay you have to write, or you have to submit recommendations, or you have to submit a test score. Some schools are still doing that. Um, but some schools will also tell you, these are our strict GPA eligibility requirements, or these are the courses you must have taken and passed in high school. And so those pages can also be a great way for you to find out, oh, this is a school that we have a shot at. So we can consider, and again, I say, just because the school you have a shot at doesn't mean you have to say yes. You can still look for the schools you have a shot at that you love. But the admissions page on virtually any college website is a great place for you to look for what are the schools that I have a shot at? What are the schools that are going to be option, good options for me? And I mentioned earlier that I was gonna talk about a student who didn't go to one of the schools that she and her family thought was like, this has to happen. But part of the reason I say to really focus on the search is that when you focus on the search, when you focus on going past just those default schools that might come to mind immediately, you can start to show your student, oh, there are other great schools. Great schools aren't just the ones that show up on that, like, that one list that you saw or the first page of that list. There are so many other great schools and it can give you a chance to start celebrating earlier how many great schools there are, how many great schools your student can consider. And that also then lines it up for the second part, which is, I do think is very important for parents to celebrate every step of this process with your students. We talk all the time about building a balanced list. So having some reach schools, some target schools, and some likely schools. And likely schools are those schools where if a student doesn't get in, we're all like, we're basically in cardiac arrest. Those are schools where we, we basically knew they were getting in. There's schools with a, 80, 90% acceptance rate, Depend and not every, not every student is built the same way in terms of what is likely for them, but those are the schools where, based on everything we can see, we, we know that kid's getting in. But you should still celebrate those. So this is her, this is Jill. This is Jill, Whew. this is Jill holding her Michigan State cake. And Michigan State was her safety school. It was the school that we knew she was probably gonna get into. It was the school that she applied early action for so that she could have something on there for just in case. It was a school that she would have been happy to go to. It checked off everything on her box. It wasn't the school she was most excited about on her list, but it was still a school she was happy to go to. It's crucial. Every school on the list should be a school that you would be happy to go to. Yes, it may mean that you are disappointed that you didn't get into another school, but taken in a vacuum, that is a school you would be happy to go to. Every school on the list should meet that. So her mom decided early on, you know what, I understand why you say we should celebrate all of every admissions, every acceptance she gets, because we don't want her to feel like something's wrong when there isn't an acceptance coming in. We want her to know that every acceptance is great, every acceptance is created equally. It's about her deciding where she wants to go. So her parents, when she got her Michigan State acceptance, which was the first one, her mom painted her that that painted, baked her, that green and white cake. And she made her a cake in the colors of every school she got into. And if she didn't get into a school, she got to destroy the cake. That was far too much sugar for my opinion, but that was a kid who loved the process, loved going through it, and was really proud of everything that came in. In the end, Jill went to Arizona State, University of Arizona, who? She went to University of Arizona. She got into the Honors College, she got a massive scholarship, she went to University of Arizona, and the family was thrilled. Not only, she was going to a good school, 
She was in the honors program, which is an amazing program at University of Arizona. She was going for basically free, and she loved it. It checked off everything on her list. She was there. This is her parents at a football game at the school. They all went to celebrate her. They went to visit her whenever they could. And she did amazingly. She is currently a product manager at Microsoft. She did wonderfully. She didn't get into her top school. Her top school was USC. She didn't get into USC, but she was proud of every school she did get into. Her family celebrated everything that she did, and she knew that she had built a list that was going to do what she needed for her. She knew that she'd be excited by every single one of those, and it went very well. Because those 40 schools with the scary news are not the only 40 schools that can set kids up for successful lives, that can set kids up for successful careers. Look past those, do the research to find the other schools that are great options. Now, the next thing I think is super important for working on admissions for students who don't have the perfect GPAs is focusing on where they do really shine, focusing on where they do really stand out and where they do have those strengths. The places that we are most likely to form new synapses are the places where we are already strong. Students are most likely to be able to improve in the areas that they are already talented, where they are already strong. If you focus so much on just improving your weaknesses, you are going to be limiting yourself. And that's true of the students too. Now, I'm not saying to give up on everything, but I do wanna show you a report card real quick. And everyone in the room, especially the parents, just take a second to look at it. And I'm gonna guess, but I, all, I just wanna know, which grade on this report card is the one that catches your attention the most? And I'm gonna guess it's that one. I'm gonna guess that most of the parents probably gravitated toward that C in chemistry. And the immediate reaction to seeing a report card like this from your student might be, we need to focus on chemistry. We need to fix chemistry. We need to make this better because you have to be well-rounded. You have to be capable of doing everything. You have to have A's across the board. You have to have at least B's across the board. Now, I wanna say, I don't think that we should encourage students not to try. But I do wanna say that I do not think that we need to pressure every student to try and perfect everything. I do think that this student might want to have a conversation with their parents about how and why, like how did this grade come about? How, what can we work on? How can we make sure that you are proud of what you've gotten? But I also wanna say that I've had students with a C get into great schools. I've had students with a C get into one of those top schools. And I've had students with Cs not get into one of those top schools, but get into great schools and have great careers. Because this student may not shine in chemistry, but this student's doing great in other subjects. This student's getting an A in English. And if this student wants to major in creative writing, if they want to major in history, if they want to major in psychology, all of those fields that are much more related to English than they are to chemistry, it is understandable that chemistry might not be their strong suit. I mentioned at the top of the hour that I was a mathematician in my undergrad. Fun fact, I don't know any science. Um, the only science I know is physics, and that's because it's math with words in it. Um, I was never good at science, and I never tried to make myself amazing at science. I did well enough in science that I could get to where I wanted to go, but it was not my strong suit, and there were some clear indicators that it was not my strong suit. But I also wasn't asking to be a scientist. I was asking to be a mathematician. And I actually wrote in one of my applications that I wanted to be that math dude who got to help Oppenheimer make the next thing he made. In retrospect, maybe not the thing I should have written. But, because fun fact, Oppenheimer wasn't actually good at math. He had a whole team of mathematicians. I wanted to be one of them. I had no desire to know chemistry. I still don't want to know chemistry. The word titrate is the only word I remember from chemistry, and I am happy with that. But my point is, no student needs to know everything. There's so much of this pressure for like, they have to be well-rounded, they have to be great in every way. And fun fact, colleges aren't even looking for a kid who's great in every way. They're not looking for the most well-rounded orb of a human being. I actually do a lot of work with my students to try and make them a little bit pointier because they're not looking for a jack of all trades, they're looking for somebody who's trying to be an ace of one. You don't need to already be an ace of one, 
but they're looking for somebody who's trying to be an ace of one, because you're not gonna major in well-roundedness anyways. <laughs> they are looking for a student who is interested in something, passionate about something, wants to do something. And again, you don't, I'm not saying that you have to decide on your major, I do wanna be clear, I'm not saying you need to pre-major, but starting to understand what you love, what you're great at, and what you want to focus on, that's really helpful, and that's also a great way to start looking at this. And I do want to say that it's not just about the grades. It's also about the, it's, it's part of the extracurriculars and everything else. I, I had a student a couple years ago who was, he, oh, he was on the ski team. Um, Cameron Roberts on the ski team. Cameron graduated senior year with one point from his ski team. One point ever over the four years he was on the team. Um, and he got his first ever, and you get points from placing not the bottom five in a ski race. He got his first ever point. Second semester of his senior year, and the only college that got to know about it was one college where he sent in an update letter after he was deferred. But he was on that ski team. He was on the varsity ski team at Westwood High School. Westwood in Massachusetts, not here. Um, and for three and a half years, he was almost dead last in every race. But his team loved him because Cameron loved skiing. He was committed to being on the team. He did everything he could to make sure that everyone else loved being on the team. He knew that he wasn't the star skier, star racer on the team. So he spent more of his time making sure that people were having fun. He organized team socials. He like, they had to take those long bus rides to the mountains. He did so much of that. And so that was like, his parents asked me at one point, should we, should we take him off this team? Because he's not, he's not, winning this, this isn't building up his resume. And I said, no, because his team loves him. His coach loves him when he writes his applications. Because again, it's not just about focusing on the good grades. It's about focusing on the student and where they shine. So many of the college applications involve the essays. There's the big personal statement, and then there's those smaller supplements. And I, was t I told his parents early on, when Cameron gets there, he's going to be able to write about how he loves this. It's gonna be very clear that he's not doing it to build his resume, because as you pointed out, it's not building his resume. <laughs> but it'll be so clear that this is a kid who loves being a teammate. This is a kid who loves doing what he can to make sure that other people are enjoying themselves, to make sure that other people feel connected, that they are able to enjoy the things he enjoys. And Cameron actually won his like, coach's like, MVP award and his coach said, sorry, it was the coach's award, not the MVP award, but he won the coach's award his sophomore and junior year because he was the best teammate. He was the best team member. And an admissions officer looking at that is able to see, like, okay, Cameron, here, Cameron's not going to be on our ski team if we have one. He's not going to be skiing for us. We would like to win. But we know that a kid like that is someone that our campus would love to have. That's the kind of kid that other people would love to be going to school with. That's the kind of kid that might actually be wonderful for our professors to have in class. Because we can see where that kid shines. We can see what, like, we can see who this kid is. And Cameron's grades were good, they weren't amazing. And Cameron got into some schools that I would say were reaches for him. And I told his parents this early on, I was like, we, we made that story pretty central to him because we focused on what he was great at. And I do truly believe that Cameron's story, us focusing on where he shines, is part of how we got into those reach schools. It's about finding, it's about not harping on what's wrong or what is perceived as wrong on the student's profile, on their, on their application, on their resume, on their report card. It's about finding those things that are great about them because every kid has something great about them. My younger sibling, second worst person on the planet. My older sibling is the worst. My younger sibling had things that were great about him, and we put those on his application. You can do that with your kid. You can do that for yourself. And that gets a little bit to the next point I wanted to make, which is that encourage, encourage three areas of focus within the college application, because they do exist in a few different categories. So one area is like confront the past unpleasantness. Don't try to hide anything on your application. You, you don't necessarily need to make your application a confessional, but don't try and hide pieces of your application. They're going to see it, so confront it. I, I, I'm, I'm using a lot of anecdotes, I know, but it's just because it's easier for me to speak, but I have a kid who got a D 
in a computer science class that he took. He was taking a college-level computer science class. He had taken a few computer science, he had taken a few college-level courses um, and done well in them. And so he was a little too confident when he went into this and he didn't properly read the syllabus. And so all semester long, he was submitting everything wrong. <laughs> and so he didn't realize until the end of the semester, and he got a D um, because it was too late for him to fix it. And when we were putting together his application, he was like, how, like, can we, like, do I have to submit my college transcript? And I was like, well, if you don't, you're gonna be missing the five other college classes that you have on there, which is an amazing thing. Like, you need to submit, the, you, got, you got A's and B's in five college level courses while also doing well in school. Submit that. Um, and he was like, okay, well, like, can we, like, can we say that it wasn't my fault? And I was like, no, don't make excuses. Colleges don't want to admit a student who is making excuses for themselves. Confront the past unpleasantness. Be honest with them. Every year I hear kids who are saying, well, I didn't get a good grade in that class because my teacher didn't like me. Maybe one in a hundred chances that actually happens. Maybe there actually is a circumstance where a kid does have a personality conflict with their teacher. Don't say it because one, when colleges read that, their assumption is going to be, I bet, I bet some kids did get good grades in that class. Probably true. And two, they're going to think, well, we don't want our professors to be dealing with a personality conflict in the classroom. So whether or not that was the case, that's a red flag. Do not present it that way. My kid, Sharia, with a D in his computer science class, when, he, when we wrote, put together his application, we didn't make his whole application about it, but we confronted it in the additional information section. And it was, the first line of it was, I took a college class and I got a D in it and it was my fault. <laughs> and he followed up and he, with a very honest explanation of, I had been taking a couple of these classes, I thought this was how you uploaded it because that's exactly how it was for every other class, this was at the same school, it was totally on me, I should have read the, I should have read the syllabus better, I've under, I've, I understand that now, I've learned from it, I'm actually retaking the class right now with that professor and he's working with me to help me remedy it because that grade wasn't gonna be done in time. Shari has still got into some um, truly amazing schools because he confronted it, he didn't, they're gonna see it, don't try and hide it, and don't try and lie about it. Be honest about it. And then the other side is, highlight the successes. Highlight the good things about you. There are accomplishments you should be proud of. There are things that you are great at. Same with that report card from earlier. Maybe that kid doesn't have perfect grades, but that kid's good at English. Talk about how good you are at English. Talk about why you're good at English. Talk about why you enjoy your English class. They're gonna ask you, why'd you pick this major? Talk to them about why you picked your English major or why you picked a major that's related. Like, maybe you wanna major in marketing or communications because you like writing. Okay, great. Tell them how English class helped you learn to love writing, helped you learn to love communications. You have skills, you have accomplishments. Focus on those. Because colleges do want to admit kids that they see, we get it. We know that this kid is working on something. We know that this kid has an idea. We know that this kid does want to go to college. And communicate a future impact. Talk about how, this is one of the big ones I think, and it's what I said earlier about kids, kids without great GPAs aren't necessarily, it's, they're not bad kids. And it doesn't mean that they're not trying. It doesn't mean that they don't wanna to go to college. Communicate that. Communicate how your GPA is maybe not an accurate reflection of what you want for your college life. Communicate how the grades you had, the grades you had freshman and sophomore year, aren't a reflection of what you were hoping for yourself for the next year. If you've turned it around in your junior and/or senior year, talk about how and why that turnaround happened. Let they understand that you are human. Colleges aren't going to colleges writ large are not going to penalize you for not knowing at age 14 what you wanted to do at age 18. They, under, they are people. They understand that you are people. They want to understand what are you aiming for? What are you gonna try and do? Why are you, why are you trying to go to college? Explain more than because I wanna go, because I wanna join a frat. But <laughs> they, want to, they want to get to know that. And so tell them what you're looking for. Tell them what your goals are. Show them that you have goals. And again, you don't, I'm not saying that you need to have your life planned out. You don't need to be able to say, I want to major in this and then I want this career and then I want to work at this company and then I will be at the Goldman Sachs. That's not what they're asking you of. That's not what they're asking of you. 
If you have that, wonderful. If you don't, that's okay. Tell them what you do have. Tell them, I haven't decided on my major, but it's because so far I'm interested in these three things, and my school has some great classes for me to explore them, but I've only been able to scratch the surface, and so I need to try these three things out even more so that I can decide which of them I really love once I've gotten my feet even wetter. Talk to them about how undecided doesn't mean you don't have interests. It means that you have too many interests so far and you need more time to settle on one. Talk to them about how I didn't do amazingly for a couple of years, but that's because in high school I had to do a little bit of everything, right? I had to do a lot of everything. And I'm not good at everything, but I'm good at this. And that's what I want to do in college. And I know I can do well if I get to focus on what I am good at. The joy of college is that you get to pick your own classes. And so, like, as a math major, I took one science class in all of college. It was physics, AKA math with words in it, as discussed earlier. I got to talk about how I knew what I was doing. It's why I didn't apply to a technical school, because I would have had to take more sciences. That's why the search matters. It's about finding the place where you can succeed. It's about finding the place where you can tell them, I know I can do well here because I know what I can do well, and that's what you will ask of me, and I have a plan. Talk about what you've done. Confront, confront what didn't go well. Explain how and why that isn't a sign of what's going to come next. Explain where you did do well. And then talk to them about how you're going to focus more on what you can do well and how you're going to take that with you to college. Last bit of advice I want to share is to think about things this way. Every, like, a kid at any step of the process after the first one can go to college. You don't need to be, I, I get that this turns into an ugly duckling in the end anyways, but I think that's a duckling. Or maybe it's a chicken. I don't know biology, that was part of my point. Um, but you don't need to be a fully formed academic. You don't need to be a fully fledged scholar to be ready for college. You can be just starting to understand that you have potential. Sequestra. Right. Okay. Uh, you, like, you can be, like, you can have a little bit of knowledge of what you're capable of, of what you're ready to do. Or you can be ready to strut. You can be ready to show up and own the place. It's a, it doesn't matter. Colleges are looking for kids at every step of that. Every college needs to have a little bit of a microcosm. And remember, there are so many schools. There are schools for students who are super focused on the arts like Emerson. There are schools that are really focused on pre-professional development that have co-op programs where you as one of your years of college, get a full-time job for a year, like at Northeastern. It's, Northeastern's a five-year school, not a four-year school, because for a year, you don't pay tuition, you get a full-time job, they help you set it up. Um, there are so many different schools for so many different types of students, with so many different types of goals, with so many different types of needs, with so many different GPAs. And again, the reason I emphasize the search is and I want, I want to harp on this. Just because a student doesn't have a great GPA doesn't mean you have to settle. That kid still has room to be picky. That kid still has room to pick a school that they want to go to. It may not be the name of a school that they already had in mind, but they can, if you take that name out, what did they like about that school? Did they like the size? Did they like the location? Did they like how, how much school spirit it had? Did they like what majors it had? Did they like that there were fraternities and sororities? Did they like that there weren't fraternities and sororities? Break it down, figure out what they loved, and look for a school that checks off all those boxes. I mentioned earlier that there's the reach, the target, the likely, in that for Jill earlier, Michigan State checked off everything she was looking for in a school because like, no, Michigan State wasn't USC, but it gave her everything she liked about USC other than those specific colors. Look for that because that exists. No matter what level, and I say this, I will say, I know that this is for kids without great GPAs, but I will say, even when I'm talking to kids who are looking at like the Ivies, I tell them, fun fact, that's a sports conference. It's just eight schools that play sports together. I don't care if you love Brown, what do you like about Brown? Fun fact. 
Tufts is just brown in Boston. Bard is brown in Annandale on Hudson, and Bard is, Bard is brown in every way other than name, and it's a school for kids without great GPAs. You can find, you can find whatever you were looking for at any school at a school for a kid without a great GPA. I wanna make that very clear. Like, Brown has nothing other than its name that you cannot find at a school for a kid without a great GPA. Yale has nothing other than its name, and being in New Haven, which isn't that great anyways, um, <laughs> Yale has nothing that you cannot find at a school for a kid without a great GPA. No school has something that you cannot get for a kid without a great GPA. Pretend the schools don't have names, and you can find a great match for a kid without a great GPA. Uh, as promised, that QR code is how you can access some of the free resources that we put out. Um, so you can find the two, as promised, very long white papers that I wrote. Um, I apologize in advance for how long they are, and one of them has like a 50-page work cited. Um, but you can also find a lot of other shorter resources that we put out. We, do, we have videos with information. We do a lot of blogs. There's a podcast with information, so you can watch it, read it, listen to it. Take your pick. Um, and then you can bounce all over the website if you want, but that should take you directly to our resources. I'm gonna give you a second before I go to the next slide, just because I still see phones pointed. I'm gonna go to the next slide, okay, cool. Um, and this is a post survey, so it's like the one that you did before, but for after. Um, this is just to update the information that you had in there.